Today is August 2nd, 2019. I am Ethan Ray, and I am interviewing Lee Stout at the Newkirk Public Library in Newkirk, uh, Oklahoma. I'm a member of the Newkirk 4-H go Gears, and this is for the Oklahoma Military Hall of Fame Project. What motivated you to join the military? Well, I, I grew up in San Diego, California, which is a big Navy town, Navy, Marine Corps, several bases there. My father served in the, the Navy in World War II in Korea. My uh, grandfather served in the Army in World War I. My great-grandfather served in the Missouri Cavalry in the Civil War, so I kind of have a, a legacy there. <laughs> so I think that was probably the main motivation. I grew up with it all around me and figured that was the right thing to do. Tell me a little bit, a little bit about your time in basic training. Well, it's never. It's always the worst part of anybody's experience in the military because it's a, it's a big change. But um, originally, I enlisted in the army. I uh, went to basic training at Fort Benning, uh, Georgia, uh, in January of 1987. I believe. Anyway. Uh, Got hurt while I was there, so I got sent home on a medical discharge, and I had to wait two years, and then I joined the Navy. So after that, or Navy Reserve anyway. But basic training is just—it's they wear you out. It's a—it's a seem to be a, a big mind game where they they try and get in your head. But if you once you realize that as long as you do everything you're told, that you'll be fine. What was your primary job after training? Uh, in the Navy, I was an intelligence specialist. So I was enlisted for four years, and then I got a commission as an officer and uh, worked in intelligence the entire time I was in the Navy. Were you deployed? If so, where and what for? Well, I was in the Navy Reserve, and I got recalled to active duty in 1991 during Operation Desert Storm. Um, I, the base that I reported in at was Naval Air Station Dallas, and then I was assigned to the USS Tarawa, which is an amphibious assault ship. We had about 2,000 Marines on board, and so I it took me about two weeks to make it to the ship, going from Dallas to Detroit, Detroit to Tokyo, Tokyo to Guam, Guam to the Philippines, Philippines to the United Arab Emirates, and then rode a supply ship, and then rode a helicopter over to my ship. So it took me it took me a while to get there, but that's we were in the Persian Gulf uh, throughout the. Well, before the land uh, phase of that operation took off, and then we're there, I think I got home in May or so of that year. What was the most demanding part about your deployment? Well, at the t I mean, you felt like, okay, I'm doing this because that's what I signed up for. And so this was always a possibility it could happen. And, so you, you knew you had that obligation to go, but a wife and child at home, and so that was very hard to, um, I think that was probably the hardest part, is just leaving, not knowing if you'd ever be home again. And for me, anyway, that was the worst part. Where did you serve the, the majority of time in service? Well, uh, the reserve, or Navy Reserve Intelligence Program is very broad. Uh, and they... You can be a specialist in one area, but they typically like you to be a generalist so that you can maybe work in just about any different area. I spent time in a Joint Intelligence Center Pacific unit, which is out of Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. I spent time in the United States Southern Command, which is, was out of Panama at that time. Um, I spent time in two F-14 squadrons, VF-201 and VF-202. Uh, and then I was also on staff at the Naval Strike and Air Warfare Center in Fallon, Nevada for a while. What rank are you most proud to have earned and why? Well, I made it to Lieutenant Commander, which was 04. Uh, like I said, I started out as enlisted, so I went in as an E3 and had to you know, spend my time doing all the not-so-fun jobs that junior enlisted people have to do. Uh, but just keep your nose to the grindstone. And I had a college degree when I enlisted too, so that helped a bunch. But um, going to Desert Storm, doing a good job, and then I think having the right sponsor when I got back helped me get that commission. And then uh, promotions for officers are based completely on your performance evaluations. There's no tests or anything once you get 
and the officer side of it. So it's just making sure you do a good job and you have a good commanding officer that takes care of you. Which medals or citations are you most honored to have received and why? Well, um, in my job, there's not really a lot of uh, um, flair or, or, you know, because we're always kind of in the background working in intelligence and uh, we're the unsung folks that nobody ever gets to see, really. So I received a Navy Achievement Medal, that which, which is good. I mean, that's nice to have. But I think the probably the more important ones are the... Southwest Asia Service Medal and uh, being part of that whole Desert Storm operation were probably the ones that I think were the most important. Tell me about some of the special people you met. Well, uh, lots of working in intelligence also puts you in the mix with lots of uh, flag level officers, admirals, generals. Uh, even as a junior enlisted person, the intelligence staff is working very closely with all the um, higher ups, uh, just because that's just the way it's set up. Um, but it did, and in the Navy Reserve, uh, in the in intelligence side, it was more exciting because we had people from all different walks of life that uh, came together. I know some people that worked in the State Department. I know some people that were one's a professor at OSU, one's a, an attorney. At, um, I mean, there was just that some were police officers. It was a big variety of folks, so it was very interesting to get to meet all these different folks that came from all around the country to your unit each month. What was the best and worst military food you were served and why? Well, the worst is going to be midrats, they call it, on board the ship, which is um, when you're at sea and if you're working, we were working 12 hour watches, so I worked at 6 at night to 6 in the morning. Well, um, everybody else is asleep, and so your your uh, lunch, so to speak, was mid rats at midnight, and it was basically everything that was left over from the day before, or whatever they happened to throw together. So that was probably the worst. Thank God they always had peanut butter and jelly, so it uh, saved you whenever things were bad. Um, and then the best, I think, uh, on board ship as well, when we were... We had, uh, there in Desert Storm, we had all the Marines on board from the 5th uh, Marine Expeditionary Brigade, there's about 2,000 of them, and we put them all ashore. Well, as soon as, the night after we put them ashore and we went back out to sea, um, they cooked steaks and crab legs for us so that, that they had been keeping back, so I guess for when the Marines weren't around. <laughs> Eat them all. <laughs> Tell me a funny story you experienced that had only happened in the military. Well, I think, uh, I was thinking in Desert Storm, and uh, this was back in the day before cell phones, so we didn't have access to call home, and uh, it had been several months since we'd had a chance to call home, and so we had stopped at a port in Saudi Arabia called Ras al Mashab, and uh, our executive officer on the ship made arrangements for every person on the ship to get a phone call home from, a, there was a fleet hospital unit there in that port, and they... Uh, so they took us up by bus, you know, groups at a time alphabetically, and we had to stand in this long line. I mean, it was long, long line to get in there. And while we're standing there, all of a sudden the air raid sirens go off <laughs> because of the Scud missile attacks and whatnot. And uh, so we're standing, on, but nobody's going to get out of line. I mean, we're not made it this far. I'm not going to get out of line, you know, to call home. So we're standing there, and then the next thing, these big speakers inside the compound where that fleet hospital unit was, you know, Air, con air defense condition red and take shelter, blah, blah, blah. And we're just like, well, there's no place for us to go out here, you know. <laughs> and, uh, so we, st we stood there and watched this big missile streak across the sky and then blew up. And um, when we uh, got back to the ship later, we found out that the thing actually landed in the water about 100 yards off the pier where our ship was. So we were safer up there at the <laughs> waiting in line than we would have been at the ship. <laughs> How did your military experience affect your life today? Well, I think it several ways. I mean, obviously, it's uh, the discipline part of it helps you know that if you got a job to do, you got to get it done. You know, complete the mission, get things done, and it also helps in leadership, especially uh, both people that are appointed over you and people that are working under you, so that you uh, chain of command, I guess is what we call it, and. That's, uh, I think, helped a bunch. The training, obviously, probably never would have had anywhere else uh, 
and the exposure to the different subject matters and types of things that it had the opportunity to do working in intelligence, I know it's been a great benefit for me. Have you kept in contact with anyone with whom you served? Uh, yes and no. Um, most of our friends, uh, like I said, there are different places around the country. Um, I know a couple guys that w they were also reservists on the ship when I went overseas, and uh, one was a police officer in Missoula, Montana, and the other one was a trash truck driver in New York City. <laughs> and uh, Anyway, but those are about the, the two that I remember the most and have had some sporadic contact with them. And then nowadays with Facebook, it makes it a little easier to do that. Do you have any other stories you would like to share? Not that I can think of off the top of my head. I, don't, I mean, unless you somebody asked me a question, I, I'm not good at the remembering stuff unless it's something specific. But it, it was... A, it was a good experience. I mean, I was so for 15 years, stayed in, uh, enjoyed it, um, miss it to a certain extent, but then on the other hand, not really. So it's a, it, it has its pluses and minuses. And I think the reserve offer you an opportunity, like me, to pursue a career doing something else, which ended up being an attorney, but then going to do intelligence work, which is pretty much off the beaten track from what we were doing in the civilian life, so I liked that opportunity to do lots of different things. If you had your college degree, were you kind of older than many of the other? Yeah, when I went to basic training, I think I was 25 or so, so yeah, I was about eight or nine years older, and uh, I think because of that I didn't get messed with as bad by the drill instructors because they the 18 and 19 year olds kept their <laughs> busy most of the time, but so yeah, I was a little different. And when I went to the ship, I was I was the oldest enlisted person in our division as well because I was 30. And your family would have been that would have been hard to have been away from your family like that. Oh yeah, it was. That was the worst. I mean, all you could think about is getting home, and uh, so. I had my son, my oldest son at that time, he was, um, would have been about four. So it was, yeah, it was a pretty rough time. And like I said, without the ability now where they have emails and where you can keep contact, it was a letter. You, I mean, letters were gold uh, to get a letter in the mail, which had to come all the way from, you know, Oklahoma to the ship or the other side of the world. But they were pretty good about it. We got it pretty frequently. But that was really the only connection.